Hi. Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's MHTV. Tonight we've got two guests, uh, Leanne Patrick and Dr. Ruth Riley, who we'll introduce in a minute. Um, tonight we're talking about female nurse suicide. So if that's going to be upsetting for you, then um, you know, do mute us for the conversation. Feel free to get in touch with us afterwards as well if um if there's anything that you want to um you know want to run past us, talk to us about. Um, I'm going to hand over to Nikki, who will tell you how to join in tonight's chat, which will be either Twitter or Facebook, and then I'll go over to our guests. Okay, Nikki? Yeah, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this, because it's a really important issue that's affecting everybody. So um, if you were joining in on Twitter, follow the hashtag MHTV. By Twitter, I obviously mean X, and yes, I forget every time that we're swapped. <laughs> I just can't bear it. I think my mind rejects it. And then um, for Facebook, if you just comment in, in the chat section, we'll see anything there and feed that into the discussion. So thanks very much. Vanessa? Thank you. Yeah, lovely. So tonight we're talking about um, suicide, but we're talking from a feminist perspective about female suicides, which is a topic that we don't hear much about. And I know that I picked up on this through Twitter, Leanne, initially, through the um, through the article that yourselves had, um, had published about this. So first of all, for people listening, I'm just going to go over to you both if you want to just give a quick introduction to yourselves and why you're interested in this topic. So go over to Ruth first. You're first on my screen tonight. Um, good evening, everyone. And um, thanks, Vanessa and Nikki and uh, Dave behind the scenes. And um, thanks to Leanne as well for being here as well. It was important to have a, a nurse representative and co-author of the, the said paper. Um, yeah, I am Ruth Riley. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Surrey. Um, and as well as authoring that paper, which you picked up on, um, I'm a uh, leading a welcome funded project which will start in January next year it's a five and a half year project looking at um, why there are elevated rates of suicide amongst female nurses in particular um, from a feminist um, perspective um, using through a lens of critical suicidology which I'll explain more about in a moment. Thank you. Liam. Uh, I'm Leanne Patrick. I'm a gender-based violence nurse specialist, and I am currently leading a gender-based violence and inequalities team in the NHS. I'm also writing a book about feminism in nursing. So I'm thinking about women's experiences in the NHS and in healthcare from lots of different perspectives, and particularly how women's experiences as staff um, then translates down into the care that's delivered uh, and outcomes for patient safety as well. So it's a whole system approach, I suppose I'm interested in terms of women in the workforce uh, and as patients as well. Yeah, that's great. And I must admit, I picked up on the peer paid written because it's not something that is talked about much, is it? Um, you know, we hear a lot about suicide, but a lot of the time it is from a, a from a male perspective I think and I think we talked in the pre-chat as well around a lot of people who were doing research in this area all tend, tend to be male as well so I guess for people listening it might be a good place to start to talk about uh, why it's important that we look at this through a feminist lens and um, in terms of the female um, nurse suicide rates at the moment and so, of you really sure. Shall I start and then I'll hand over to you, Leanne, is that right? Absolutely. So, so first of all, um, I should say a bit about my back and another aspect of my background. I'm a sociologist. I'm not a suicidologist. Mm. Um, and my work to date for the past nine years has looked at working conditions and cultures experience first by GPs. And then I looked at junior doctors um, but also looking at things like, you know, how sexism in the workplace, racism, et cetera, other workplace injustices impact on people's um, well-being, including their mental health. And then um, because of the experiences of junior doctors who were on my research team, who sadly lost a friend um, to suicide, a, another doctor, I started, um, got the funding for a suicide postvention study. So we published the first ever postvention guidance for the um, NHS, which is 
if you Google NHS post-vention guidance for NHS staff, Surrey University, you'll find the garden guidance. It's the only evidence-based guidance available. Um, and through that work, I, ident I identified the elevator rates of suicide amongst female nurses, but also started looking into the kind of general literature and how the issue was framed in dominant suicidology literature. So first of all, you're right in saying that most suicide has historically focused on young men, which has potentially overlooked patriarchal social and structural systems which are unfairly impact on women. Mm. But that's one concern that hasn't really been sufficiently addressed. The other is that there's a tendency to um, over medicalize um, mental illness um, in nurses in, in, in the way that suicide is reported. So there's mm. a focus on pathology um, yet it overlooks the context in which nurses as women, nurses as a as a job, um, how their work impacts on them, um, but also as women, you know, what happens to women inside and outside the, the workplace and the kind of intersection of the two. Um, and so those things weren't sufficiently addressed in the current suicidology literature. And, I, and I started digging around, obviously did an extensive search of the literature, spoke to a lot of nurses, um, and that was the impetus for the Welcome Project. Um, so maybe now if I hand over to Leanne, she can maybe talk about some of those issues which affect nurses as women and perhaps why historically they haven't been sufficiently addressed in dominant suicidology approaches and I should say the elevated rates of, of suicide in nurses have been documented for over 20 years which is astounding mm -hmm. and yet nothing relatively has been done. Mm. Leanne? Yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? When we talk about this, particularly on social media, it gets a lot of interest. And I think when we talk about um, looking beyond the pathologizing, it strikes a chord with lots of women in nursing who have either been through this experience of losing a peer or a colleague, or who recognize the structural inequalities that women in particular face that add to stresses and factors that we might not be considering in uh, traditional suicidology when we're thinking about um, why this happens. Mm. And I think the constellation of things that are unique to women's experiences and in particular women's experiences as nurses are not necessarily well understood. They're often looked at in isolation. We often can think about, for example, that women will have additional caring responsibilities, will be aware of that women are maybe doing a second shift when they go home yeah. in terms of the household labor that they take on. We might be aware even of some things that um, relate to women being more likely to be affected by domestic abuse and sexual violence. But how do we think of those things um, together in the round? You know, How do we kind of put together that whole experience uh, when we're thinking about what it means to be a woman and a woman in nursing. And in particular things like women in nursing are more likely to be victims of domestic abuse. We don't necessarily talk about things like that either. So there's certainly, I think, an issue of being mindful of these things in isolation, but not considering how those constellation of things come together and what's at the core of those things, the inequalities women face and the structural dominance of the systems that we work in and how they are geared up to uh, work best for men. And that includes the workforce and patients. We know that women's outcomes are different from men's outcomes in certain areas as well. So it's not just the workforce. We know that these structural inequalities not only affect the workforce, they translate down to patient care as well. So I think there's something useful about thinking about these kind of constellation of uh, issues that affect women in terms of this particular issue, but actually other areas that, that might impact uh, as well, such as patient care. Yeah, 
I mean, there's so much in that, isn't there? I don't know what I don't know where to start, but I think that even putting aside suicide prevention, the way that the system's designed, as you say, the way that we pathologize people and thinking about trauma in particular, um, how um, you know, people can present with trauma and um and given a a, a you know a medical label for that trauma which in some ways goes further to invalidate a woman's experience and thinking about nurses you know we know that nurses uh, often have a history of having adverse childhood experiences and trauma and that there's a high proportion of nurses who've got that background which you know as we know often attracts people into a caring profession and I think as a nurse, I don't know what Nikki thinks, but I think for me as a nurse, there is a double stigma as well, isn't there, about working in mental health in particular and talking about your own mental health struggles and a, a sort of expectation, a, a sort of um, covert expectation, I guess, that um, that we can cope and that we can manage. So I guess that creates further isolation, doesn't it, for the, for the female workforce. But... Um, for me as well, I was just thinking that it's it's historical, isn't it? When we look at, um, you know, the history of trauma going back to the sort of Victorian era of when women, um, you know, were disclosing to Freud their experiences of, um, you know, sexual violence and trauma. And, um, and initially, you know, Freud was really interested in uncovering those stories, but because there was such a backlash from the the public then those stories were were, you know labeled as unconscious fantasies and I think whilst we've moved on have we moved on you know how far have we actually moved on from that in terms of women being able to talk about their experiences and feel safe and feel validated we know that it isn't the case that women are able to uh, speak honestly about their well-being particularly in nursing part of what I do means that I also support staff members who have been affected by domestic use and sexual violence. And sometimes I speak to people um, just through social media who recognize what I do and um, want to talk a bit about what's happened to them as well. And it's a really, really common experience for nurses to disclose to a line manager or a colleague that they've been experiencing sexual violence or domestic abuse. And for that to be dismissed, for them to be victim blamed, for them not to be given time off or accommodations to be made for their safety, if maybe they're being stalking. There's a real expectation that women should just kind of get on with these things or that it's not as serious as they're saying it is. And I think, again, that tendency to pathologize women who come forward about these things that there's just something particularly wrong with this person. And that, I think, sits in in a wider culture of uh, misogyny patriarchy victim blaming where we other people because we don't want to be seen to be um, at risk of the same things happening to us but certainly it's the case in nursing that if you come forward about domestic abuse it does not guarantee that you'll be uh, protected at work and we don't have adequate policies to support managers to make good decisions and judgments around that necessarily as well yeah yeah. Well, I think that <clears throat> that's also a similar experience um, for NHS staff in general talking about their mental health and cultures of vulnerability. And I've talked a lot about that in the past with my research with doctors. Um, it's a real issue in the NHS, including astoundingly in mental health settings. And it came through in my mm-hmm. postvention study. So we looked at the experiences of NHS staff affected by the suicide of a colleague. Um, And it came through time and time again that it was kind of the issues were and the impact was brushed under the carpet. Staff didn't feel psychologically safe to talk about how the um, suicide had impacted them. Even though for mental health, um, for those working in mental health settings, they were dealing day in, day out with suicidal patients. But that um, that wasn't acknowledged in terms of their own staff, which. As a non-clinician, as a sociologist, I find that incredible. Um, So the NHS has a real issue with cultures of invulnerability, um, but very quickly the blame is put back on the individual. We work in neoliberal cultures. You know, there is an overemphasis on individual resilience, 
self-care we hear that all the time you know across society not just in the nhs you know we hear it in academia it says it's about you looking after yourself it's not about brutalizing workplaces or toxic work cultures or cultures which you know um frequently discriminate against women you know the global majority who make up um, a significant proportion of certainly the nursing workforce 25 percent of nurses are from the global majority 40 percent in social care Mm. um so there's a lot of gaslighting in the nhs um and it's unhelpful it's divisive but also in approaches, I think, um, to suicide prevention. I think we need to, as Leanne said, we need to look, you know, all of these issues and how they intersect and impacting, impact women, nurses as women. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's shocking really, isn't it? I think what you were saying as well around, you know, nurses who've experienced suicide, then not being able to talk about the suicide, um, and having to be, I guess, re-traumatised as well by experiencing further traumatic incidents at work, including, you know, serious self-harm and suicide. And I, th- I think it's interesting because just that statistic in itself that we know that if you've experienced a, a suicide, you're more likely to go on and take your own life as well. Yes. Quite striking. Yeah, um, yeah Nikki, I um, wondered if you wanted to come in at this point. Any questions, any thoughts? Um- I haven't been looking for questions. I've been tweeting away all these brilliant oh, resources. So yeah. for anyone who's really um, interested in what we're talking about tonight, there's lots and lots and lots of information coming out under the hashtag MHTV. So please do um, get involved and have a read of that because it is really vital. And mm. we're talking a lot about sort of loss and sadness, um, mm. but it, this is all about life, isn't it? It's all about improving working conditions, improving the way that we look after each other, the way that we notice each other and creating um, an environment in which you can work. Because I think yeah. a lot of the problem comes is for me, thinking back on it. And obviously, I remember the first time I lost a colleague was as a first or second year student nurse. We had a, a female colleague die by suicide in our, in our cohort. And it's something I, can, I can't I can think of a single place where I've worked in 27, 30 years where at some point a colleague hasn't died by suicide. And it shocks me that we're only talking about this now. And when I think back on what, some of the reasons that might be the case is obviously this personalisation. So sometimes I think it's so painful to think about how close we all come to sort of sadness and being overwhelmed and sort of the darker side of the the emotions that we deal with, particularly in situations where we have less and less supervision and less and less support. It's actually almost too frightening to think about. Yeah. And I think what some of the reasons, I mean, Leanne was talking about some of the pushback we get when we talk about these things is sometimes when people feel pressured or feel um, at risk or, or hurt or sad, they push back because it's just too painful to hear. But I think the cost of us continuing to do that, it, it's not something we can continue to pay. It's it's too high. You know, if we don't have these open and honest discussions about what's going on and stop locating on, oh, it's this person, they just weren't strong enough, <laughs> this person. It's like if we don't create environments where it's safe to work and safe to be a person, then we sh- how, how are we going to help anybody? I yeah. Think- really difficult and I think the other thing that really strikes me is I think about when I first started off and the people who influenced me as a young mental health nurse who were absolutely all about coping in the most extraordinarily unbelievably bizarre circumstances you know like we're we're, we're seeing huge violence dealing with incredible um tragedy you know and from a human perspective and they're just carrying on like nothing has happened and it was almost like the better nurse you were, you, you proved your skill as a nurse by just not showing shock, not showing damage and, and just being almost like Teflon, like nothing touched you, nothing mm-hmm. hurt you, nothing phased you, nothing surprised you, nothing shocked you, nothing disappointed you. And I can remember being around nurses who showed that when now with a lot more experience, I know that's absolutely not what they were feeling because I never felt that. And and it's almost like if we don't actually start to process these emotions and look at the cost of not processing them, we're going to continue to pass this really toxic legacy onto young nurses. And I don't want that to happen. I really want us to have these conversations now, painful, difficult, upsetting, embarrassing sometimes. And I, I think 
one of the things that you experience when you lose someone to suicide, particularly when those services is, is shame mm. as a nurse, yes. like, what did I miss? And then when it's a colleague and one of the ways we make ourselves strong is by imagining like we have like the office glass person, mm. <laughs> but um, everyone on that side needs help. Everyone on this side is okay. And then when we find actually that sort of psychic and, and, real barrier is breached it can be really overwhelming for us to think about that and so we don't yeah it's it's insupportable to carry on so I'm so glad that people are talking about this and I'm so glad that people are talking about nurses as women as people because a lot of the burdens that women carry um are cloaked by our nursing identity you know mm -hmm. angels don't die by suicide do they because they're angels and you know we look at the stuff we went through with covid and it was all about making us not people you know we, yeah. we didn't need food we just need clapped we didn't yeah. need safe staffing we just needed to, to to work like trojans it's like no none of that stuff is okay so i think it's really impressive and that's what mm -hmm. happens vanessa when you ask me if i have one thought that was on yeah. mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was really. I'll go back on mute and carry on typing. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really important what you just said, um, Nikki. And when I was looking through um, the, there's a national confidential, confidential inquiry um, report, which I just want to briefly talk about because there are some things that it reports, which I feel again have been overlooked um as a response and it's something we want to address in our welcome project but um i've turned i've turned a lot to um the black american feminists who i think can tell us a lot about what we've been talking about and can i just read this brilliant quote by bell hooks mm -hmm. um she so when, when we talk about feminism, sometimes people's reaction, maybe some men are, what, but what about me? And what I want to say is, so this is her quote, and she says, I choose to reappropriate the term feminism to focus on the fact that to be feminist in any authentic sense of the term is to want for all people, female and male, liberation from sexist role patterns, domination and oppression. And I think a lot of those things apply to all people in the NHS. And then she goes on to say that patriarchy demands of all males that they engage in the acts of psychic self-mutilation, which is what we've been talking about, that they kill off the emotional part of themselves. And when I read that, I thought... You know, we know that there are elevated rates of uh, suicides in female nurses, but also amongst male paramedics. And that spoke to me of male paramedics. That's what's happening in our healthcare systems, that yeah. we are expected, we're acculturized um, to detach ourselves in that way. And it's so, it, it, it's, as she says, it's, it's psychic self-mutilation. Um, it, it's damaging for us, for those around us, for our patients. I say, our, oh, you know, it's yeah, I'm not finishing you. Um, anyone who's out there listening. Um, so I think that how incredibly poignant um is that, you know, and that was written back in the 1970s. So we can take on board a lot from um the um, and I say we're using a feminist approach it's feminisms because the welcome project will speak to everyone and it's really important because not just women's voices but so many voices within the nursing community have been underrepresented in the production of knowledge around suicidality suicide prevention um, we want what one of we have a dedicated work package looking at the experiences of internationally qualified nurses who are making up a significant proportion of the NHS. We have such high attrition rates in this country. We can't attract and keep nurses. Um, we don't have a sustainable healthcare system. We have a one in ten nursing workforce gap. The per capita rates of you know, per patient head in this country are dismally low. It's eight per 1,000 patients compared to, I think, 18 in Norway and um, midway, um, say, compared to Ireland. So it means that nurses, doctors, all frontline health, it affects all health, healthcare professionals, 
um, are doing, you know, they've got high workloads um, with limited resources. And that we know that's not sustainable. Um, so, yeah, the project is interested in uh, many different kind of groups of people, internationally qualified nurses, lesbian nurses, all, all their voices and experience have been marginalised. We just have not heard from them. I do not see their experiences, their identities in any shape or form within any suic dominant suicidology literature. And that has to change and it will change with our project. Yeah, it's really great to hear that you're that you're shining a light on this, isn't it? Because it's so important. And I think everything that everybody said tonight resonates with me as well. You know, going back, in my, you know, my career started in the early 1990s and thinking about when I qualified, it wasn't an era where you, you were encouraged to have that professional distance because, of course, that helps you cope with difficult situations. And fast forward now where we're talking about, um, you know, having an issue in the health service with compassion, but compassion links to the discussion that we're having here around nurses professionally distancing themselves from people because they're struggling to cope with the pain of other people's um you know difficulties and and I, and I think that it's all linked isn't it because you know certainly patients that I've worked with in my life who who I've met you know randomly years later who said oh I remember you because you were really human with me and I think there is you know that's happened to me a few times in my career and it's really made me think that yeah, there is something about, I mean, there is a skill, isn't there, in, in giving something of yourself still and, and being human with somebody. But that's also at a price because that can be painful as well for nurses. So I think that that's all linked and it links back to what Nikki was saying as well, which, you know, certainly would be my experience as well. Some of Nikki's reflections. Um, Leanne, I wondered if you wanted to add anything as well. I suppose I'm just thinking about that I really what I'd like to see is a paradigm shift in nursing about how we work and how we um, support women to be nurses uh, and to have you know well-developed lives a work-life balance I suppose it's you know we are several hundred years on now from the days of Florence Nightingale, but arguably things haven't changed all that much from the days where you had to be a single, uh, unmarried, childless, white woman um, of a certain level of affluence to be able to do this successfully. And it's still arguably the case that it's easier to be a nurse if you're all of those things. If you have care responsibilities, if you have, you know, if you're a single parent, if you are, um, from the global majority, it's really difficult to be a nurse and just work, come to your job and get through each day while juggling all of those things, the systemic uh, oppressions. It's hard just to be a female in the NHS, it's, but it's particularly hard to be a woman in nursing, I think, despite us being a female majority profession. We don't think about things like um, supporting people who have care and responsibilities to have flexible working arrangements. We don't think about menopause policies. We don't think about domestic abuse policies. We're just not thinking about all of these different ways that we could work very differently to support greater well-being in the workforce, increased retention. We obviously have very big issues in relation to our kind of political power and status and why we're not well paid and all the ways in which low pay and status affects us and our well-being but there are practical things I think that we can do if we just think a bit differently um, and I'm really looking forward to what some of the outputs of this research um, that Ruth's doing might be in terms of where do we go from here what does all of this mean for what we do next to make things better mm. yeah yeah because I think the impact of the research as well isn't just on suicide prevention is it it's it's earlier than that by changing our systems and processes and and actually our culture and the way we work that's going to have a an impact on the well-being of the workforce hopefully um with suicide being at you know at the sort of stark end really um because if we address some of these things then you know we'll create different cultures of work won't we I mean I do think some organizations you know certainly where I work as well are starting to look at things like the menopause which 
I think it's really, really positive. And I think there's been so much public awareness, hasn't there, in the last year about menopause. And I think actually, you know, it's really helped with some high profile people talking about their own experience of menopause, which I think has been a, a real positive. But <clears throat> Up until the past year, I can't remember it really being discussed. And obviously until, you know, I was kind of in the menopause category myself, I have to say, I wouldn't have understood either, you know, what women experienced. And, and I think it's the same, isn't it? Women who've just had children as well and come back to work. That's another that's another um, point for women where women feel vulnerable. And interestingly, I used to work in perinatal mental health and a lot of um women would would present with depression just before they came back to work and I would argue that's not biological that's because women are struggling to adjust with going back to work but obviously women are labeled with postnatal depression mm -hmm. and I'm not invalidating women who find it helpful to have that um sort of medical label and that helps them access treatment but I think there is something about the fact that women do experience depression around that time when they go back to work and they have to kind of choose between the sort of work responsibilities often and and child care and the other thing I was going to say because I know I'm I'm talking a lot now but I don't know if you're looking at this in your project but it's been interesting me recently about bank nurses in the NHS and particularly um women of color in our sort of bank and agency workforce because I think that there's something about why um they're overrepresented as bank and agency nurses and there's probably something about the sort of flexibility um, that bank nursing and agency nursing offers but at the same time it's at a loss isn't it of sort of stable employment and all the um, employment benefits that come with being employed. Hmm. Yeah. I've got Absolutely. some questions coming in so did you want to just respond to that Ruth and then we'll Put some questions in. Yeah, I think that's a really pertinent point, and it's something I hadn't considered, but it's something I will for sure yeah. consider. And I just want to say, in the spirit of feminism and feminist approaches, that this project, um, the core team, are largely nurses or have a nursing background, including an international nurse working in the US who's a international expert on moral distress in nursing. She's a nurse clinician herself. Um, British born by background um, and uh, and our team and crucially our team is ethnically diverse as well and that was really important to me um, that that we come from a from a kind of diverse perspective but the project is with nurses for nurses you know this is all about nurses this isn't about us doing research this is about us going out there Mm. Um, and really understanding all of these complex issues and how it impacts nurses, how they manage it, you know, what do they do with all of these injustice, injustices and exploitation and oppression? How is that managed across different communities and, you know, mindful of kind of different cultural approaches to um, all of these things as well? But bank nurses, yeah, that's something that I will we yeah, were looking to really thank you. Thank you. That's yeah. really important, particularly as it's the only way you can really fit childcare in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, mm. I've got three questions. I think maybe ask each one because they're all they're all great questions. So first one is Mustag. Um, hello, by the way. Um, has there been an intersectionality of the distress, inequality, and injustice experienced by the female majority and ethnic? ethnically diverse nursing workforce from our oh, from white nurses in your suicidal suicidology project and are there historical and systemic racisms explored within nursing by women yes 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 we haven't started the project yet it's just to say it's five and a half years it's a mammoth project yeah. um, and thank you to the Wellcome trust for funding this i don't think any other funder would have funded it i don't think the national institute for health research would have funded it so thank you to the welcome Tr trust and all of those who put faith in this project and me um yeah it's really important we are looking at this from an inter intersectional uh, uh perspective um mm. to capture those injustices you know to take account of race you know um as well as gender class sexual orientation age 
um, all of those things, absolutely. And also to the audience, if anyone would, wants to get involved in this project, either on the nurse consultation group, uh, which is growing in, in numbers, but we will find um, a space for you. Um, or later down the line, if you want to actually take part as a research participant, but we won't re be recruiting um, for a while. That won't be until um, next year. Um, and yeah, so hand you back, Nikki. Yeah, perhaps when, when you come to recruit, we can do a push on that so that people can. Yeah, that's that's excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Dave, Dave has used the WhatsApp to sneak a question in. <laughs> um, as well as potential bank employment there's potential disparity between those who work repeated regular antisocial hours and he's right you know you get less support you get less access to training which is a good point um and and oh. night we know that working night shift yeah. is a yeah. risk factor oh, for suicide. Yeah. yep absolutely yeah. Um, Annie Coxey, hello. Um, I wonder how or whether nurse, female nurses take on a greater emotional load related to a higher ability for empathy, I'm not sure if that's been evidenced, than their male countenance, uh, counterparts from their work, and how does this further contribute to women's well-being? Mm. Talking about yeah. different approaches to emotional load. Um, I don't know, Leanne, do you want to, to talk? There's an expectation in... Sure. I think there's an expectation in all walks of life that women take on the majority of emotional labor. So in the home, women are tracking what, you know, who's your child's best friend? Are they getting on with them? What's going on there? What does this teacher in this class say about how they're doing? What exams are they worried about? How's your mum doing who's not been well? And your grandmother, like, or and your husband's grandmother, like women take on all of that emotional load in the household. And they do it as well with their colleagues. They're much more likely to be invested in the emotional lives of their colleagues consider their manager's feelings yep. before they get involved in different things or what could be going on there. So I think women take on a great deal of that um, emotional labor at home and in the workplace. I wouldn't say that it doesn't apply to men as well, but mm -hmm. I think certainly it's much more common for women to take on the vast majority of that. And for that to be very, very taxing, I think, in terms of everything else that you're juggling as well. Emotionally, we can only deal with so many things and often we are the last thing that we think about in the long list of what's going on at work, what's going on at home, what's going on financially, what's going on with mm. my um, parents and, and all of those other things. Your well-being, time to yourself, time to exercise, eat well, maybe develop your career and have aspirations and goals out with all of these other really complicated things. Sometimes it can be easy to fall into a place of hopelessness or just trying to get through each day, I think, when there's such a huge demand upon you for your time, your energy and your resources mm. from all these different mm. um, places. Mm. We teach women and we reward them for taking on that labour and then pretending it happens by magic. So we're all about to come up to Christmas period. And if every woman down told, no one would be getting any cards or presents, no work dues would be getting sorted. like. There would be like nothing Absolutely. food on the table. And, and it's almost like a source of pride that we like hide that labor. Um, Absolutely. And yeah. actually all of that stuff, as you say, happens because of that labor yeah. and it's taken for granted. If I see another TikTok of a man giving his wife a really rubbish present like a Hoover after yeah. she's done all of the cooking, all of the cleaning, yeah. got everyone's gifts and he's just shown up and smiled. Mm -hmm. If he even gets the Hoover, you know, it's really frustrating to see that mm -hmm. all of that Mm. um is made invisible mm. and just expected mm. and so actually in, in that sense in nursing in particular that's how men in nursing can mm. thrive off the back of other women's labor almost because mm. they take on the bulk of all of that other emotional labor and mm. work mm. women don't have the time and headspace to do that self-focused work mm. and development in the same way because mm. they're taking on so much of the other stuff mm. And I think it, it kills me that we reward ourselves for it as well, that we've got to stop doing that, or at least noticing what people do for us. And I say, when you were talking about the kind of social media stuff, the ones I can't watch are when they interview a husband and wife who seem like great people. And they say mm -hmm. to the woman, what's your, what's your child's birthday? What's your child's teacher name? She just knows everything. And the guy doesn't know. And I just think, what have we done to men mm -hmm. you know, to allow a situation to be one that's so un unfair and unequal and unsatisfying? You know, it's, you know, we, all this work needs doing. We just need to reorganize it. And don't forget, Iceland went on strike. All the women of Iceland went on strike, despite being the most gender equal country. They all down tooled. 
And we got yeah. to do the same, for sure. Yeah. Talking yeah. of men in nursing, Steve Trenchard, coming to you now. <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> thank you for joining us tonight. Um, talking about uh, the need for openness and vulnerability and um, Im- uh, being honest about our emo- um, emotional states, particularly the impact of shame and how this is often masked by our other emotional strategies. Absolutely. So thank you very much for joining in with that. What do you guys think about the kind of culture of nursing, you know, kind of like pride in toughness? Mm. Yeah. How do you guys think that's influenced us all? Mm. Yeah, it's a tough one. I think um, I certainly recognise some of the experiences that you shared, Nikki and Vanessa, about um, being expected to just kind of pick up and carry on after seeing some really distressing and unusual things and the support isn't really there because it's just so normalized I think there's certainly an expectation that you have to project professional values and that you've got it all together and I think there's a tendency to want to do that when you're around people who are distressed to clear mental health anyway you want to be the um the safe landing space for people where they can kind of fall apart and you won't I suppose in their darkest moments so I think there's lots of things that encourage women to to keep those things to themselves and there's not many places where they can let that in a a productive and safe way if that makes sense Mm. yeah and also you're a woman going into a leadership post it's no crying Mm. for you (laughs) so you have to work that much harder I think absolutely I interrupted you go on yeah no I think well I think but I was going to make a comment about the shame um the shame comment that Steve's talked about because I think that's really important and um I know you know when working in prisons thinking about shame in terms of people's sentences you know was a massive issue in relation to trauma and people's experiences and mental distress but haven't really considered it from the perspective of nursing and I think that's so important when we think about what we've just been talking about about the need to be heroic and to be able to deal with you know all these difficult especially in mental health thinking about you know violent incidents and some of the other really traumatic experiences that that you know we face in our day-to-day work and and that need to just cope with it and then if you can't cope with it um as I say as feelings of professional shame about not being strong enough and about showing vulnerability when actually that's what we should be modeling that's the culture we should be developing and I think it links to what Nikki's just said about leadership I think it's really important as a leader that we model that we can lead with compassion and we can lead with care and that we're not just focused on numbers and statistics but we're interested in people's stories as well and and you know what people tell us through narrative rather than you know being um you know focused on the sort of mechanistic view of services and and you know what people's experiences are so I think it's all for me it's all very much linked Mm -hmm. together and it, yeah. it's so important because that inter- internalised shame mm. leaves you feeling really isolated. And I know that's come through a lot in my research and it I'm sure it will come out in, in the Welcome Project as well. Um, and I do think compassionate leadership, I mean, I know it's a buzzword at the moment, but it's really yeah. important. And my I myself, uh, uh, I'm now working in a very compassionate work culture but that hasn't always been the case. You know, academia is known for being quite brutalizing. Yeah. I've worked in a number of medical schools which yeah. were incredibly brutalizing and misogynistic. Um, and now I notice I, I can I can see, I but also importantly, I can feel the difference of what it's like to thrive yeah. and flourish and be vulnerable and to be safe to be vulnerable and all of those things yeah you know, it 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 should be a given and not something that we you know that that that's kind of by by potluck you know mm. you can work in a really really great team with a great leader um but you know so many participants that i've spoken to in my i'm in my research um kind of you know circle through teams to find their tribe um Mm. and they can they they know when they're in a healthy working environment but it's a bit hit and miss in the nhs 
Yeah. yeah, I think I think we need to start finishing up there on the on the understatement of the year there, Ruth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Really> <laughs> <is goodness. laughs> yeah. So should we? Um... Yeah, I can't believe actually that we're coming to the end because we've had such an involved conversation, haven't we? It's flown, I think. But I guess as we are coming to the end, Leanne, should we go over to you first just to share any final thoughts and any sort of takeaway messages for people who are listening tonight? I suppose just to kind of tie up, you know, my interests um, and the whole system approach to this and what um, Ruth was just saying is, thinking about person-centered cultures and I think sometimes when we think about that we tend to think about just the patients or the people that are accessing the services but a really good person-centered culture is one that thinks about the staff in that culture as well and where we all fit into that and I think that's going to be really key to how we move this forward because ultimately at the sharp end of this if we don't get it right for women in nursing we're not going to get it right for the people that they are caring for either. So true. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Ruth? Yeah, I just want to, well, I want to say thank you um, for inviting us on. And um, I look forward to coming back and talking more about the project as it unfolds. Um, I feel really proud to be leading such a game changing project as well. And it's really going to um, get people thinking and to, you know, to critique I guess um, the status quo um, and ways of thinking about this issue which really should have been thought about a long time ago Um, but this is what we're going to do now um, and for the next five and a half years um, and I look forward to hearing the experiences of nurses across the country I should should say working um, across the the four nations as well this is not an england-wide study this is across the nations so so it's a borderless um project which was really important to us as a team as well yeah it's amazing and we'll look forward to having you back as well and um and i guess for people who are listening tonight as well your offer of how people can get involved if people can contact myself nikki and, and leanne you're also on twitter aren't you as well um and we can um we can put people in touch with Ruth that way and um and as you say as the project develops it'd be great to have you back on here um for a future conversation as well so Nikki any um final thoughts from you um, Steve's just added a little bit to what he was saying before talking about that macho ways of co- coping and um, referring to Paul Gilbert's model on compassion about demonstrating compassion to oneself and to others so even if we treated ourselves the same way we try really hard to treat other people that would be a start i think and and to really reject this kind of like coping in the face of and, and actually just saying what when things aren't aren't tenable anymore and actually being a little bit more honest about our kind of working conditions and that talk, talking of black feminism when you know better do better you know we know better we've had this information for a long time we haven't used it and now it's in everybody's faces and we need to do something different we can't keep doing this has to be different so thank you very much and thank you very much guys and this is this is life-saving research and i I love to see it being led by women and and nurses i think it's brilliant so thank you for that yeah thank Thank you you. yeah i mean it's been amazing having you both on i'm so glad that we've had you on as guests tonight and it really has flown because i think there's been so much in this hasn't there to talk about and we definitely need to come back and have um, a follow-up chat i think as well in the future so i guess on that note really um i'll say um good night and um you know if yeah we'll see you next week if you have any more comments reflections then you know do tweet those or put them on the facebook live and we will pick those up later good night everybody good night bye bye everyone